great pleasure to introduce my distinguished colleague, uh, Joe Pizet, and he will talk about the lifting property for algebra. Uh, Joe, it's all yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you tonight, and uh, thank you to all of you for for coming to to this uh, to this virtual meeting. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to, to talk about the, the lifting property for sister algebras and uh, uh, a recent result uh, about that. Um, but let me start by, by defining you know, uh, the, the setting. So the lifting problems that we wish to, to discuss. We have a sister algebra C and we look at the quotient by an ideal, of course, close to sided self adjoint ideal. So the quotient is a sister algebra. And then we have another sister algebra A. And uh, we look, so now, Golian, you, you're okay. You have uh, now the, the setting, the, the diagrams appearing, right? Yes? Yes. Okay. So, uh, so for me, uh, I look at the, uh, lifting problems are in two ways. So the, the standard classical lifting problem is we have a map U from a sister algebra A into a quotient sister algebra. Q is the quotient map. And we ask whether there is a, a good lifting U hat from A to C, okay? So this, I, I'm starting just very general terms, but um, uh, of course we will be concentrating on lifting of unital completely positive maps by unital completely positive maps. But, but we can ask for the general setting. And by the way, I, I can't help repeating it, but it's, it's an open problem within the setting of separable sister algebra, whether any bounded U admits a bounded lifting. And this is something that has you know, always bothered me a lot that this remains open, but this, this apparently I think I'm right. This is this is still open. Very irritating problem. But but this is not what I'm going to <laughs> to go into. And then in parallel to the lifting problem, there is always a, a local lifting problem, which uh, uh, here is is just the following. You have your 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 good map U from A to the quotient, but you restrict it to a finite dimensional space space or a finite dimensional operator system. Now you look at the, the restriction to this finite dimensional object and you ask whether the restriction lifts. So there is a uniformity, of course, you're going to ask for uniformity over E of the good liftings. This is the, the John abstractly, the, the local lifting problem. Okay, so, so now to be precise, if we have a sister algebra, we say, that it has the lifting property. So A will be my object. The sister algebra A has the lifting property. If any, for unital CP map, uh, sorry, a unital sister algebra and a separable one, separable one, we say that it has the lifting property. If any unital completely positive map lifts to a unital, admits a unital completely positive lifting. So is liftable completely positively. And then the local lifting property, local lifting property, maybe I should get this smaller a little bit because it'd be nice to have a little more on the, on the screen. I'm not sure this is good. So you AA has the local lifting property if again for any quotient, now any map U which is unital completely positive from A to the quotient is locally liftable by which I mean that for any finite dimensional operator system E, the restriction lifts, admits uh, a unital completely positive lifting. Okay, so you notice that for the lifting property, I restrict it to separable, and then I don't for local lifting. So there is a definition in the non-separable case that you know covers, covers that, but I, I will not go into the non-separable case. So I, I I, I let this leave this out. Okay, so also about unitization, it's just simple for non-unital sister algebra. We just define the lifting property or the local lifting property by saying the unitization has 
the property that we have just defined. Okay, so uh, there is a, an open problem, which uh, is really, you know, the motivation for the work I'm presenting, even though I'm not able to say anything about this problem at the moment, it's been bothering me a lot. The problem is simply whether in the separable case, the local lifting property implies the global lifting property. This was asked by Kirk Berg in his Inventiones 1993 paper. And uh, main motivation for me, uh, apart from actually there are some other, but uh, main motivation is that if the cone embedding problem has a positive solution, then this is true. So since I recently constructed a C-star algebra, which has the local lifting property, but I'm not sure it doesn't seem to have the lifting property, this somehow led me to explore uh, the lifting property and to try to understand better the global lifting property and obstructions to the global uh, lifting property. Uh, the sister algebra that I'm alluding to is a recent counter recent example that I also don't want to talk about, which is the sister algebra, which is both local lifting property and weak expectation property. And it seems that this type of example could be made not to have the lifting property. So it would give uh, an alternate solution to the coin embedding problem, because according to as you all know, a, a, a famous uh, a preprint uh, that still needs to be checked, but which is uh, made a, a very, uh, you know, had a huge impact in, in the field uh, by uh, Jean Atarajan, Vidic, Wright, and Yuen. Apparently, the, the problem has a negative solution, the Cohn embedding problem, which I usually describe as the Cohn Kirchberg problem because Kirchberg has equivalent C star algebraic. So, versions and the con problem is the problem about phenomenal algebra. Okay, so the, the examples of C-star algebras with the lifting property, well, are like this. The, the classical example that, you know, you, you've all uh, remember because uh, some of you were, you know, uh, there at the time, Choi Efros proved a remarkable result uh, in the 70s that nuclear sister algebras have the lifting property. And this is, I think, a paper in, in annals that had a you know, huge impact. So that means for group sister algebras, if the group is amenable, you have the lifting property. But strangely, uh, a number of years later, to about 20 years later, Kirchberg showed that the sister algebra, the full sister algebra of any free group also has the lifting property. So this is like the opposite of a nuclear sister algebra. It is the opposite of a nominable group in some sense. And this has the lifting property. So that's, uh, that's a, a strange class, perhaps, if you so, sort of look at it from this, this angle. Uh, I have here a, a small digression. I, do not want to talk, I will not talk much about reduced sister algebras. The, the, I will concentrate on this Kirchberg result and variations of it and, and so on. But for the reduced sister algebra, just to say that, you know, what is the situation? So it is known that if the reduced sister algebra is a quotient of WEP. So for those of you who don't know what it means, it means that let me say it like that in the, you know, in the, from the Kirchberg uh, philosophy, it means the bidule of this sister algebra is isometric to a quotient of some B of H. So it's the bidule is, is a quotient of B of H as a Banach space. So that's one way of defining QWEP. So if we believe the, the preprint of uh, uh, Vidic and four other authors, then there are counterexample, but for the moment, no counterexample is known. And if a sister algebra like that reduced has the local lifting property, that's equivalent to the group being amenable. So for the, for the groups that are reasonable, the local lifting property will not happen in the reduced sister algebra, okay? It will not happen. That's uh, because that's just the amenable group. If, we, if you find a counterexample to what I'm saying, you're solving the cone problem negative. Okay. 
So uh, a, a little more background on uh, liftings. So uh, of course, as you all know, a separable unital sister algebra uh, can be thought of as the quotient of the full sister algebra of the free group by some ideal, simply because we can take the unitary group, it's separable and then map the generators of the free group onto the unitary group. So we get, we get this algebra A as a quotient of the full sister algebra of the free group. So uh, automatically uh, we can reduce the lifting problem to just in some sense, the identity map of A, all we have to lift is the identity map of A. If you decide that you look at the identity map of A uh, abusively as the isomorphism from A to the quotient of that full sister algebra of the free group. Okay, so, so let's say that this is you know, the identity. If we can lift the identity through this sister algebra C, which is this free group sister algebra, since the free group sister algebra has the lifting property, this A of course will inherit the lifting property. So that's, that's no problem. So if you look at it this way, lifting property, you know, algebras with lifting properties are very simple. They are, they are the algebras that you can, you know, represent as an operator system inside this full sister algebra of free group. And then you have a completely positive con unital contractive projection. That's, you know, that's, that's the same thing. But of course, th that's not so easy to describe. You still don't know what it is. It's a little bit and I'll, I'll say more on that. It's a little bit like when you're dealing with injectivity. If you say that an injective for Neumann algebra, you know, is a for Neumann subalgebra of B of H with a projection of norm one, you haven't you haven't uh, finished the subject. Quite to the contrary, you're only beginning the subject. This is the analog of that fact. This is the analog of that. Just. The, the sister algebra of the free group in the theory that I'm describing today replaces B of H. You'll see this actually quite a few times. Okay, so now obvious, you know, the obvious consequence of what I said is that lifting property can be reduced to just saying that any unital star homomorphism U admits a good lifting. So we can restrict to good maps U but the lifting, of course, will not be a star homomorphism. In this case, it always we, will be stuck with the unital completely positive maps, right? Uh, star homomorphism that lift to star homomorphism that gives something, you know, ve ve very trivial. The algebra A will be very a trivial object. <clears throat> so, uh, of course, for the local uh, property, this is the same. So if the identity, what I call the identity, locally lifts, this is characteristic of the local lifting property. Okay, so we could say that a, a discrete group G has lifting property if the full sister algebra of G does, because then we have this strange, this strange class of groups that appears inside the lifting property, the union of amenable groups and, and free groups, which is always a little bit surprising to put together. So once, once you see that you have these two classes of groups inside the lifting property, it's of course not so easy to, to find counterexamples because you know, usually when you go against the minable, well, the first thing you try is the free group. So uh, for instance, um, to reflect the fact that counterexamples are not easy to find, it's an open problem whether the product of two free groups has any of the two properties, either the local lifting or the global lifting property. And this is- Is, is, it, uh, known for, is, is it known for hyperbolic groups? No, I think, uh, I, I think not, no. Because hyperbolic groups have exactly these properties that you cannot take the product of two hyperbolic groups. So they are, they are, uh, they are very much in this type of category that you are talking about. I think it's not known uh, Maybe not yet. I think it's a little bit uh, out of reach, actually. It's very, very little. It's a little bit embarrassing. <laughs> very, very little is, is known. However, so very, very little was known until recently. And uh, however, there was a paper first by Ozawa in 2004, where he showed uh, by somehow an existing argument, some kind of 
cardinality argument and uh, using you know a uh, certain class of groups having cardinality of the continuum and getting a contradiction so not explicit he, he showed that there are groups because you see this was not even obvious failing the lifting property since we had three groups amenable groups you know well you could have been every group so he produced a group failing the lifting property and he could not do the local lifting property so that was done by by tom who produced an explicit example failing the local lifting property this was related to property t in both cases um, and then recently johanna spas and virsma actually uh, went much further and and proved that the the usual groups with property T, that is SLN Z uh, for N at least three, uh, fails the local lifting property. So it seems that property T goes against uh, local lifting, but in fact, it is still open whether a general property T group fails either local lifting or, or lifting property. Uh, they showed a very uh, pretty result about the lifting property, which uh, I was going to actually show you uh, a proof in the end, and then I decided that I had, what I had prepared was much too long, so I, I shoved it. But the, the result they have, which I like very much, is if a C-star algebra, if a group has the lifting property and property T, then it is finitely presented. So that's a, that's a, a rather striking uh, result. This, uh, this uh, uses in particular Shalom's result that uh, a very important ingredient in there is that any group with property T is a quotient of a finitely presented group with property T. And then somehow there is a, there is a, a, a trick that I was going to, to show you that, but I, decided not. Okay, so that's that's the situation about examples and that's basically all, all there is. So let me give you quickly uh, some background on, on uh, tensor products of, of C-star algebras, on which, by the way, I, I uh, last year finished a, a book. So there is a book, Cambridge University Press, on tensor products of C-star algebras and operator spaces that has, well, certainly, all the background for my current talk. So this started in Japan in the late 50s. And uh, I think uh, Turumaru is maybe the first person. Then, of course, uh, as you all know, Takezaki did important work in the late 50s. Guichardet uh, in parallel in France. Lance had uh, you know, <coughs> major, uh, major advances. And uh, Choi Efros Kirkberg in the period 76, uh, 77. Choi Efros, of course, based on the advances of uh, Alain on uh, injective for diamond algebras. And then also, actually, that applies to the paper of Efros Lance, very important landmark paper in the later 70s. Then another period uh, started with Archbold Batty, Efros Hagerup which revolved around something called local reflexivity, which will play a role later. And then there's this paper of Kirchberg in 1993, Inventiones, which has a lot of results on uh, tensor products of, of C-star algebras. So I remind you that we have <clears throat> fundamentally two tensor products, the minimal one and the maximal one. So when A and B are C-star algebras, this is denoted like this, A tensor B min, A tensor B max. And then they're obtained by completing the algebraic tensor product. So beware that for me, this notation here is the algebraic tensor product. So you equip the algebraic tensor product with what is usually called the spatial norm. So you look at your tensor acting on the tensor product of the Hilbert spaces where A and B are acting, Hilbert space tensor product, and this defines the minimal norm. And then you complete and you get the minimal tensor product. For the maximal <coughs> tensor product, the definition is that you look at all representations of pairs of representations of A and B with commuting ranges. So this is very important. The representations are on the same Hilbert space 
and have commuting ranges, <coughs> you take the point, you take the product of the two ranges, so the product of the two representations, and uh, that gives you a star homomorphism on the algebraic tensor product. <coughs> you can define, you, you take the norm and you take the soup overall such pairs. So that again defines a norm, that's the maximal norm and the maximal tensor product is obtained by, by completion. So there are two more uh, which have some interest, uh, two more variations from Efros Lance, the nor normal tensor product. So this is when one of them is uh, a sister uh, for Neumann algebra. So the first one here is, let's say we write it if A, is a von Neumann algebra, then this is the same thing as before, but the, the representation on A, which is a von Neumann algebra, is restricted to be normal. And uh, so that's the normal tensor product. I should say the left normal, and then there's the right normal, but that's, that's sort of usually implicit. And if both are von Neumann algebras, then the binormal norm, binormal norm is when you do it on both sides, so you restrict to pairs of computing normal representations on your von Neumann algebras. So with these definitions, there is a, a very pretty result, which uh, is here, which is that, uh, the, so this is from all these authors. So the, the, the tensor product in the bin, the bin binormal tensor product of the biduals of the sister algebras embeds isometrically in the bidual of the max tensor product. So in other words, the norm of this guy on the right induces on the algebraic tensor product on the left precisely the binormal norm. Okay, so now I've continued by uh, 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 saying a few basic facts which are important for, for what follows. So of course, uh, I guess this is Takezaki, any sister norm is sandwiched between the minimal uh, norm and the maximal norm when you look at the sister norm and the algebraic tensor product. After completion, you have that. And of course, an, an algebra is called nuclear by definition if the minimal and maximal tensor product coincide whatever the second sister algebra C that you take is. So for any C, you have this equality, that's nuclear sister algebra. Now, there are very important facts for you know, the, what comes next in the, in the talk that I need to recall. The, the very big difference between the two tensor products is that as is well known, the minimal tensor products is injective and it's very simple to verify. So it's injective in what sense? in the sense that whenever I have an embedding of C-star algebras B inside C, and I do the obvious tensoring with A, I get an embedding of the minimal tensor product of A and B into the minimal tensor product of A and C. For the max tensor product, it is not so. It is what, what is the analogous elementary fact is projectivity. And projectivity is that if you take the max tensor product with a quotient, then you obtain a quotient of the tensor product. So you have commutation between quotients and max tensor product. And here you have commutation between inclusions and mean tensor product. <clears throat> and of course, since I'll be dealing with lifting, as you will see, I'll be led to concentrate on the max tensor product. Okay, and so we, we've just, we just wrote this as equalities, projectivity and injectivity. Now, the opposite, the opposite is that in general, in general, it is not true that the minimal tensor product is projective. The minimal tensor product is not projective. So we have that this is not true. And if we take the max tensor product, it's not injective. So in the same situation, this will not be true. Okay, and <clears throat> as I'm sure some of you know, the, the C-star algebra is A for which the, the, there is no problem, for which there is no defect. These are the exact C-star algebras. And here, the C-star algebra is A for which there is no problem here. I think 
as a consequence of a con result, I think it can be shown that these are just the nuclear sister algebras. But for a general A, we, we are stuck. We, we have to worry about, about this. Okay, so uh, uh, a first uh, result, which is a characterization in terms of tensor products of uh, <coughs> local lifting is due to Kirchberg. And it says that uh, if you take a C-star algebra, A, then it has the LLP if and only if the minimal and maximal tensor product when coincide when you tensorize with B of L2. So you have uniqueness of tensor norm, of C-star norms on A tensor B of L2, if and only if you have the local lifting property. Now, in such a statement, there is not much difference from B of L2 and any sufficiently large injective uh, C-star algebra. So sometimes it's more convenient to use uh, the algebra B, which is the, which the, I prefer to denote as the, the direct sum of the family of matrix algebras MN in the L infinity sense. And in the C-star literature, this is denoted by product of MN, but because of my Banach space roots, I have, uh, I, I resist this notation. I, it's it's uh, silly of me, but I, I can't write product of MN for, for a Banach space. <laughs> Okay, so uh, that's Kirchberg's characterization of the local lifting property. Now, uh, what are the, the stability properties? So uh, they, it's easy to see that uh, they are stable under finite uh, products. So I would say finite products, what did I mean here? Uh, yes, okay, fine, well, sort of, okay, Dirac sub, right? <clears throat> and then uh, they both are stable under extensions and they are stable that's for the llp well they are both stable under full free products maximal free products of arbitrary families of sister algebras so for the local lifting property i i i, I proved this in a, a paper where i gave an alternate proof of some of kirchberg's results and for the lifting property this was uh, proved by Boca in a, in a pay follow-up paper that he wrote on the subject. And actually, <clears throat> it is very easy for the lifting property because Boca in 1991 has a paper where he showed that if you, if you have com unital completely positive maps, uh, well, they, you, can take the, you can take the free product, you can take their free product to create a free product unital completely positive map on the free product. So this, if you have that, then you, <clears throat> you, you, you fairly easily see that uh, if the identity of a family of sister algebras have the property that each has an identity which is liftable, then their free product will have an identity which is liftable just by applying book as result because the identity is a free product of the identity, right? So <clears throat> then, okay, I think that's enough to say. Okay, and uh, the local lifting property is, as one would expect, is stable under closure of union of arbitrary nested families of uh, C-star algebras. But here there is a, there is a glitch. Uh, it is actually not clear for the lifting property, for the lifting property itself. Uh, I suspect that it is not true. Of course, that's because I'm pessimistic. I also suspect that uh, the local lifting does not imply the global lifting. That's, I guess that's what I mean uh, in particular. I, I've been trying this angle <clears throat> to produce, uh, you know, local lifting that's not, that's not satisfying global lifting, but so far <clears throat> no success. So the, the main result that uh, I want to show uh, today <coughs> is a, a new characterization of the lifting property for a C-star algebra. And it's in the spirit of what I just showed you, which is this criterion of Kirchberg, which is purely tensor product for the local lifting. It's going to be purely local, purely tensor product, just a little bit <coughs> more complicated 
And the major difference is that now we, it will involve only the max tensor product. So we look at a property which is going to be the property star. Okay, so from now on, I will refer to the property star here. And <clears throat> it's the following one. You look at any family of C-star algebras, DI, and you look at the, 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 the space L infinity DI. So this is, you know, this notation I have for the direct sum in the sense of L infinity of the family DI. So of course that's non-separable object because, right, we just, <clears throat> direct sum in the sense of L infinity. So you'd call it maybe the product of the DIs. And then you take the algebraic tensor product with A, right? So this tensor has finite rank, so there's no problem, it has finite rank, and you have no problem to define immediately the coordinates of this tensor of finite rank. So you project to each DI, and you have a TI, which is also a finite rank, so in the algebraic tensor product of di and a, <clears throat> and the property star says that the max tensor product of a with this L infinity algebra is actually the same as the soup of the max tensor product of the coordinates. So I'm saying it is the same, but of course the, what matters in the property star is this direction, the, the inequality which is not trivial is that this norm is less than the soup of the coordinates. The other inequality is obvious because <laughs> we can go from the L infinity direct sum to each coordinate, that's a star homomorphism. And so of course that star homomorphism, you know, diminishes <clears throat> the max tensor product. So the soup of the coordinates in the max tensor product is less than the norm, which is on the left. So that's the same as saying there is equality here, but I prefer to write it like that because what is significant is this inequality. So in other words, that means that uh, we have a, a natural isometric embedding of this max tensor product of A with L infinity di and the L infinity direct sum of the max tensor product. So it's again a property of commutation. We now uh, are considering the property that the L infinity direct sum operation commutes with the max tensor product, except that of course, well, this has to be an inclusion because you know we, we, are, we are here looking at, there, there are algebraic, linear algebraic obstruction. These are finite rank tensors. This will not be in general. So it has to be like this. So the main result in this box in yellow is that lifting property is equivalent to, to this. So of course, uh, one remark that one can make is that now if we replace the max by the min norm, so it's the usual thing, we have a, a quite opposite situation. This is always true because L infinity di, you know, is the same as if we want a realization, it's the same as a block diagonal, block diagonal realization of our family of sister algebras di, and then for the minimal tensor product or spatial tensor product with some A, well, we know that the norm of a block diagonal you know, operator is the soup of the norm of the blocks. So in that case, it's true, of course. So for the minimal tensor product, this is true. Okay, so uh, I will introduce a notation which is abusive, but uh, I hope uh, uh, you won't mind too much. I, I will explain. So if I, if I have a subspace of a C-star algebra, I introduce the max tensor product of a C-star algebra D and E simply by doing something very innocent. I embed E into A. So the algebraic tensor product embeds in D tensor A max, and I close this with the max tensor product. So what I'm starting to do here is, uh, you know, the, what the thing which will continue in the rest of the talk is that I'm actually going to develop the analog of the theory of operator spaces. I'm sure uh, many of you have, have seen, you know, or heard talks on operator spaces. On operator spaces, you, you, you use preferably the minimal tensor product, and then you consider an operator space as a subspace of some B of H, and use the minimal tensor product of this subspace with 
other operator spaces or with sister algebras. So I'm going to use what I could describe as a max theory of operator spaces. So I'm going to use the parallel, a parallel theory to operator space theory, just using the max tensor product. However, there is a major different, a major caveat, of course, which is that the max tensor product being not injective, what is abusive in this definition is that this notation D max E, what is incorrect is that it depends not on E, but on the embedding of E and A. That is, it is, it is relative to the larger algebra A. If I embed A in some larger B, then this tensor product relative to B will be different. So that's what is abusive here. But I will use it in a way that you know, it, it won't matter. So, <clears throat> but one has to be careful. This is the reason why you know, this maybe hasn't been done so much that there, is, there, are, there are immediate difficulties appearing because of that. Okay, so <clears throat> let, me, let me perhaps uh, show you uh, because I'm not going to be able to give too many proofs uh, in view of, of time. Let me show you at least uh, a proof that uh, lifting property implies star. So I could actually, well, there are uh, two ways to do it. I, I choose to do it in a way which might not be the simplest, but uh, it allows me to say something which I do want to say. So, so this is the easy implication. Of course, what, what is interesting is that just this tensor product property contains the whole lifting, you know, contains the whole essence of the lifting property. So let me, let me, let me sketch this. So we have this algebra A, which is a quotient of the free group C star algebra. And uh, we need to show this inequality here, which is this basis of the property star. So there is a trick which I, I've used in other, you know, lots of other situation, which is in some sense a, a linearization trick, which is that to check this, it suffices to check it on uh, the linear span of the unit and the free generators of uh, the group when we are talking about the free group here. So we enumerate the free unitary generators uh, of the group, say n minus one of them, and then we stick in the unit and we call En uh, the linear span. And then with the previous notation that I've used, so this is viewed as embedded in A, C star algebra of the free group. <clears throat> then we need to, it, it, it actually suffices, it can be shown that's a side result, that it suffices to show this. <clears throat> and then the, the preliminary, the, 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 the ingredient that makes this work is the following fact that when you take this <clears throat> linear span of the generators, which as a Banach space is the n dimensional version of little l1, <clears throat> but as an operator space, it is something special. When you use it with the max tensor product, then it can be shown that you have a formula for the norm. So the norm of some xj uj in the max norm, as I've indicated, you can compute it. So there's a formula and the formula is very fairly simple. <clears throat> and you have to think with the analogy with little l1 that you have in the Banach space case. So little l1, uh, unit ball of little l1 is product of elements in the unit ball of little l2, okay? So this is the analog of, of that that appears here. So your coefficients x, j will be in the unit ball for this norm as written on the left here, if and only if your x, j is the product of elements a, j, star, b, j, which are in L2 with respect to these norms. So <clears throat> this is the column norm for the b's, column norms for the a's, when xj is aj star bj. And now if you have this formula, well, I didn't write the details, but I will just say them by waving hands. You see, you have now, you have this formula. So you look at your, your ti, you have your index, you have your index coordinate, and you know that for each index i, for each index i, 
you're in the unit ball. And you want to show there that you're in the unit ball when you take the, 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 the xj now in L infinity of di. So it is completely straightforward. You look at each coordinate, it's in the unit ball. So each one factors like this. So for each coordinate, you have your aj, your bj in the unit ball of this, in the unit ball of this. You have this for each i. So now you form aj, which has the ith coordinate that you've just found. That gives you an element aj in L infinity of di, an element bj in L infinity <coughs> of di, and that produces that produces the inequality in the last line. <coughs> I'm sorry, I didn't write all details, but what I like about this uh, argument is that actually it can be shown that all the examples with the lifting property must be like that. That is, a sister algebra has the lifting property. It's, it's too long to make it explicit. But I have a result that says that a sister algebra has the lifting property if and only if when you take an arbitrary subspace E, an arbitrary sister algebra D, E is a subspace of your sister algebra, you have a formula for this max tensor product. You have a formula which is compatible with you know, taking projections onto the coordinates, which, is, which behaves well with respect to homomorphisms. That is, you have a formula here, which if you take the image under a homomorphism, well, you still have the formula. I, I don't know how to, if this actually exists in a formal language, uh, but, but I couldn't, I, I have a precise statement that explains what I'm saying now in case you're interested. So there is, a, it, is it is actually equivalent to have a lifting property and to have something like this line here. This is, I think, an important point. Okay, so now, you know, the main, the main tool we, we use to do our, our functional analysis will be analogous to uh, what is done for operator space, just instead of completely bounded maps, we use what I call, I needed a name, so I call them maximally bounded maps. <laughs> and so a maximally bounded map, uh, U from E to a C star algebra C is just a, <laughs> a map that uh, is bounded when I tensorize with any C star algebra D and I use the max tensor product, okay? So if you put the minimal tensor product instead, you get completely bounded norm and completely bounded maps. Okay, so I denoted uh, MB for maximally bounded from E to C, and this goes into a C star algebra. Of course, it could go, I could take this definition also with values in, you know, a subspace of C, but if it goes into a subspace of C, I might as well consider that it goes into C because I'm using anyway C to define the max tensor product. So that's just simpler. Okay, so uh, one of the main tools uh, for, uh, for what I'm uh, presenting is uh, decomposable maps. So decomposable maps have, you know, there are important paper by Hagerup in 85 about that, and uh, a very important theorem also of, of Kirchberg, of which <coughs> the theorem which is written here is a, is a variant. I like to emphasize it as a description of maximally bounded maps. <coughs> and so the description is that a map U from E to C is maximally bounded, if and only if it, is, it extends on the ambient C star algebra A, it extends to a decomposable map. What is a decomposable map? A decomposable map is a map which is a linear combination of completely positive maps. And of course, it means a linear combination of four completely positive maps. And if it is a self-adjoint, if the map has self-adjoint, then it, it will just be the difference if it is decomposable, it just will be the difference of two completely positive maps. Okay, so uh, let's see. This is this goes away. So now you see a, a map, a map U from E to C is maximally bounded. That's what the theorem says. 
if and only if it extends to a map which will also be maximally bounded because decomposable maps, you know, you have here an equality. So of course, decomposable implies maximally bounded, but you have uh, you have to enlarge into <coughs> the Baidu. Okay, and I, for those of you who are not familiar with decomposable norm, I just wrote here the definition uh, by or the result of Hagerup that <coughs> for a V which is self-adjoint, the decomposable norm is just exactly uh, the infimum of the norm of V1 plus V2, when V is the difference V1 minus V2, both completely positive. And in the non-self-adjoint case, self-adjoint is means what is written here for any A. In the non-self-adjoint case, uh, Hagerup has a, a, a generalization of the definition, so that's no problem. We don't need to restrict to, to self-adjoint. Okay, so there's a strong connection between maximally bounded and decomposable, and you see maximally bounded satisfy such a nice extension theorem. Here, by the way, again, there is an analogy because Completely bounded maps, the big success of completely bounded maps, of course, is related to, you know, what is sometimes called um, Alveson's Han Banach theorem, that if you have a completely bounded map with values in <coughs> B of H, then it extends to any, you know, larger ambient C star algebra as a completely bounded map with the same completely bounded norm. <coughs> so here we have, we have that provided we go to the bidule, we have this, this extension here. So I, yes, I should have said that, you know, u tilde dec, I didn't write, u tilde dec is the same as u tilde mb. So this theorem also says that <coughs> m, the, if u is mb, u extends to a u tilde mb with the same mb norm. Okay, so here is a, a statement of uh, the, the main result, so the equivalence between uh, the lifting property has lots of lots of variants. So uh, I selected uh, six, I, I went a little far in the, the paper, by the way, the paper has been accepted in Journal of Non-Commutative Geometry, and I think it's supposed to appear, maybe it has just appeared. And, um, it gives the variants uh, are are all very easily derived once you understand that uh, A1 and 2 are equivalent. So this property star that I've emphasized is really the main point. But it's equivalent to, for instance, the property 3, which says that for any finite dimensional subspace of A, then you have this mapping here, this natural map that uh, has norm 1. and uh, this is again analogous to something that appears and is very important in uh, the completely bounded operator space setting, which is local reflexivity. So if you, if you replace MB by CB here, this is the definition of uh, C being locally reflexive if again, A is replaced by B of H. Okay, so this is uh, amusing. Somehow these, all these parallels have, have are amusing, they, they somehow have, there is some point in them, if you can relate them to this whole, you know, injective projective game that I started to emphasize earlier. Okay, so another equivalent form is, if you take a bidule and you tensorize with A in the max sense, then this will be isometrically embedded in this D tensor A bidule. So, you could phrase this with the binormal, you remember I said something about the binormal tensor product of the bidule. So that could be substituted uh, with this on the right, but to, simpli to simplify, I didn't do that because it's kind of <clears throat> included in number five. So in number five, you take any von Neumann algebra M and then you take the max tensor product with A and then this coincides with the normal tensor product with A. That is the same as the max, but restricted to uh, normal representations on M. So by the way, this property five 
Kirchberg considered it, and he showed that the full C-star algebra of the free group satisfies this. This is uh, one of the things that I could reprove in this paper I mentioned of uh, 96 with the linearization trick. Uh, he showed that the full C-star algebra of the free group satisfies this. He showed actually that the lifting property satisfies this, and then he stops. He doesn't say anything about the converse. And I think that he doesn't consider the property star anywhere. Uh, at least I, I never saw it. But this one, number five, he does consider. He does show that lifting property implies five. So he shows one implies five. Now, what is probably the most interesting thing for applications is uh, the connection with ultra products. And so if you take any family of C star algebras and any ultra filter, then you have a, a natural isometric embedding, which is again a commutation uh, property of the ultra product of the family DI tensor max and the ultra product of you know, the max tensor product. So this is again, for the same reasons as before, it cannot be an equality because the, the space on the right is, is too big. But what you can expect is that on the algebraic tensor product, the norms coincide, and this is the content of property six. Okay, so I think I'm actually at the end of my time. I probably passed it by one minute, and uh, I can stop here. So, you know, I have, of course, I, I had a couple more slides, but I think it's a good time just as well to, to stop if you, if you want. If you want me to stop on time. <laughs> oh, uh, so, Adele, you can finish the slide. We would like to hear it, actually. Uh, OK. OK, so, uh, well, this, this is just uh, trying to give uh, an idea of what goes on. So <clears throat> if I concentrate on these properties uh, here, the main point was that 2 implies 3, so this property star why does this property star implies this sort of local reflexivity? Uh, this requires uh, actually some work involving just uh, looking at the dual norm to the norm of maximally bounded from E to C with E finite dimensional. And so I, I, I just look at this norm and it turns out that if you have property star, then the, the, you, you, you're immediately led to what is needed for for this bidule. So you have to, to this involves the bidule of MBEC, so that's not, not so surprising. So then <clears throat> the main point is becomes why three implies one. So why this local reflexivity implies the lifting property. And then of course, here appears something which perhaps I should have mentioned earlier, but which is that if you pass to the bidules, all the lifting problems, of course, are, are, are resolved because when you pass to the bidules, of course, you have a direct sum between the bidule of the ideal and bidule of the quotient. So you have a lifting, which is a, a star homomorphism. There is, there is no problem. But local reflexivity gives you, you know, what is needed for, uh, to, to, to get rid of the bidule and get a, a bona fide lifting into the into the sister algebra. So what is amusing is that there's an argument which is a two-step. So you can uh, you can prove uh, in the setting when you have this property star, you get uh, immediately a nice lifting theorem and also a nice extension theorem, and that gives you the the result using, of course, Arvison's principle, which <laughs> I also could have mentioned earlier, which is a very basic tool uh, in the theory of very important fact in the theory of lifting, which is that pointwise lift in, in short, pointwise limits of liftable maps are liftable. Okay, this, this principle in the separable setting is, is very useful and it's, it's used here. So another formulation of this uh, local reflexivity is that anytime you have a, a maximally bounded map uh, here, well, I, I, I should have corrected, in the unit ball, here in the unit ball, there is a net in the unit ball of uh, now maps with values in C, which converge to U 
pointwise weak star, weak star in the weak star topology of, of C double star. Okay, and then I finished by uh, advertising my book and uh, thanking you very much for your, for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jim, for a thank wonderful you. talk. Um, are there any questions or comments? Yes, I have. I have one one question, which is the following. I think it would be very good to look at the case of hyperbolic groups, for the following reason: because many of them have property T. So, I mean, if you want, they, they share these properties that they are kind of rank one in the sense that you cannot make their product. But uh, many of them have property T, so it would be great to to find whether you know they have this uh, lifting property or not. I mean, this, I think this is a, uh, an interesting uh, kind of examples because uh, yeah. I mean there are reasons for and reasons against. I mean, <laughs> the reasons against is that they have property T uh, in many many cases, and the reason for is that they are really you know, having these properties that you were talking about for free groups and so on, that uh, you cannot just take their product. I mean, it will uh, it will not work out. It's yeah. open, so, uh, Alain. It's not so clear. Yeah. <laughs> well, perhaps you're convinced already that it won't work for the product, but it's... Uh, yeah, it's no, open. no, I understand that it's open, but I think if you want the more general question than just this product is the case of a bubble group somehow, yeah. Okay, okay. So, okay. so, so there, I, I know that uh, the hyperbolic groups come up in the original argument of Ozawa for exhibiting uh -huh. a group, you know, failing lifting property. Thank but you. this is within Thank this huge class of groups he uses Thank results of Gromov and Olchansky uh -huh. and uh, I see. I see. related to the random related to the random groups, you know. And, I see. Uh, so it's perhaps already. Result. No, it's not. It's not uh, definitely no, it's not. far from saying you know that that uh, that property T uh, hyperbolic mm -hmm. fails uh, lifting property. Mm -hmm. It is very far from that. I think we're very far from that. Okay. Yeah, geometrically, if we take the uh, some kind of outer limit, it uh, the hyperbolic groups behaves a little bit like like the free group. It's a tree. Uh, mm -hmm. So maybe mm -hmm. that's yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, that could be a start. Yes, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So to show that it would be uh, would have to be free, then yeah, mm -hmm. something like that. So, any other question and comment? Not yet. Uh, do you mind if I uh, ask a question that might be a little simple? Oh, no, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, first off, I want to say uh, thank you, uh, Professor Fizier, for giving this talk. I spent the last four months uh, studying your book, uh, your new book on tensor products, and uh, learned a lot about the weak expectation property and uh, a little bit about the lifting property, too. So I really appreciate all the work that you and your colleagues have done on this stuff. So thank you. Uh, the question I wanted to ask is uh, could you provide some intuition as to why? There's this sort of like apparent duality between the weak expectation property and the local lifting property. I mean, you have um, like the weak expectation property is characterized by nuclearity of A and what is it, C star of F infinity. And then you have the same thing with uh, A and uh, B of L2 for the, lo the local lifting property. And then you have these sort of uh, similar, like the weak expectation property by a theorem of Lance. Uh, gives you that A tensor max B is contained naturally isometrically in A tensor max C. So it kind of resolves, or it gives you, it goes from injectivity, which is natural, to projectivity, sort of. And I was wondering if like the, the local lifting property gives you the converse, but it seems like it wouldn't because the uh, C star algebra is A for which A tensor max min C over I is equal to, you know, the quotient of A, ten of A tensor min C over A tensor min I. Those are precisely the exact algebras and exact weak expectation algebras are just nuclear C star algebras. And so we know that, you know, the local lifting property can't do that because of the algebra you exhibited in your paper recently. So I was wondering, like, uh, what, uh, what the intuition can you provide for the duality of these concepts? 
Uh, no, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm afraid. Uh, I'm afraid I can't say uh, anything. Uh, perhaps it. Perhaps you know. Perhaps there is something missing that would uh, sort of explain a little bit better what you're saying, but. Uh, yeah, of course, the, for me, the, the central, you know, as this is the way I organize the book. So the central piece is what I call this theorem of Kirchberg that says that if you take the pair full C-star algebra of the free group, which is the universal projective object, and then you take B of H, which is the universal, you know, injective object, then the tensor product of these two, there's a unique C-star norm. So this is, you know, the, it's, it's very, nice to see the theory you know derived from this fact as i that's what i like to do but it's true that it doesn't exactly uh, <laughs> explain uh, i think i see what you're asking and it's not <clears throat> it's not doing that uh, i'm i'm sometimes you know wondering along the lines of what you're saying but uh, <laughs> without uh, without much success I think a lot, you know, of course, uh, with analogies with Banach spaces, which sometimes is a little bit silly, but of course, for me, uh, the full C-star algebra of the free group, the full, of course, it's important, is analogous to L1. Of course, it has lifting properties, so this is natural, and B of H is analogous to L infinity. But uh, that doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't really, do what you're asking. It's it's all and and it's also just a kind of a metaphorical. Or, mm. Yeah, I see. Well, thank you, nonetheless. Sure. Okay, so, any other question or comment? Well, uh, if not, let's thank Joe again for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.